Hello, and welcome to this latest installment of Emory University's Health Storytelling Author Q&A series for the spring semester of 2023. I'm Maren McKenna. I'm a journalist and author and senior fellow in the Center for the Study of Human Health at Emory University, and I'm the curator and host of this series. In a moment, I'll introduce you to my guest, who is journalist, professor, and cultural clinic, Stephen Thrasher, and his profound book, The Viral Underclass, The Human Toll When Inequality and Disease Collide. But first, let me tell you about this series. At least once per month during the academic year, we invite writers whose journalistic or academic books examine health, the science and history of health, and health's intersection with society. This series of conversations originates at the Emory Center for the Study of Human Health, and the entire year of productions is co-sponsored by the Georgia Center for the Book, which is an affiliate of the Library of Congress, and Science Gallery Atlanta, which presents exhibits that live at the juncture of science and art and ignite creativity and discovery. And this year, we also benefited from co-production with the Atlanta Science Festival, which works with more than 80 community partners to celebrate and expand science learning opportunities around Atlanta. This series is live streamed on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, and it lives on YouTube in an archive. And already this year, we've heard from Berkeley professor Elena Konis with How to Sell a Poison, The Rise, Fall, and Toxic Return of DDT, which was published by Bold Type Books. And also journalist, scientist, and podcaster Bethany Brookshire and her amazing book, Pests, How Humans Create Animal Villains, which was published by Echo. One final note, this is a live event. You can interact with us and we encourage you to do that. If you're watching on YouTube or Facebook, your comments will come through to our live stream platform. We apologize, this integration no longer works for Twitter. Our producer, who is Stefan Kaplan of Spin It Social, will make sure we see what you've said and will put your question up on screen when I pose it to our guest. Do note that I'll turn to your questions in the second half of this live stream, but you can put your questions into the box or into your comment panes at any time. We really hope you do. So now let's turn to our book and guest. Stephen Thrasher, PhD, is an assistant professor of journalism at the Medill School of Journalism at Northwestern University, a place dear to my heart. I got my master's there. He's the first person to hold the Daniel H. Renberg Chair of Social Justice in Reporting, which includes and emphasizes attention to issues relevant to the LGBT plus community. He previously worked as a writer at The Guardian, the Village Voice, and the audio project StoryCorps, and was also a researcher for Saturday Night Live's Weekend Update. His work's been published in all the best places, including the New York Times, BuzzFeed News, Esquire, The Nation, The Atlantic. As an academic, he's investigated the racialization and criminalization of HIV and the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement. He was on the ground in Ferguson, Missouri in 2014, in the week that Michael Brown was killed, igniting nationwide protests. He studies and reports on how racism, homophobia, policing, and medicine and health intersect. The book we're gonna talk about, The Viral Underclass, came out last October, and it got an incredible and deserved reception. It was long listed for the Penn John Kenneth Galbraith Award for nonfiction, also long listed for the Andrew Carnegie Medals for Excellence, and it won the Paz Award for Best in Literature. So with all of that, let me introduce you to Stephen. Stephen, welcome to our live stream. Thank you for that uh, incredibly kind introduction. So I really would like to start with you telling, uh, so obviously I just did the official bio, but I'd like you to tell the folks watching us just a little bit about sort of what you were about and how the book came about. 
Um, they're very related things, so so I can do that. The, the book came out of a story that I've been reporting on for almost a decade now uh, about a young uh, Black gay man named Michael Johnson who was accused of uh, transmitting HIV to um, other people. And for people who don't know, you can be prosecuted in most states in the U.S., I believe in Georgia where you are, no longer in Illinois, they decriminalized it where I am. Um, but in most states in the U.S. and about 70 countries around the world, people can be prosecuted for HIV transmission, exposing HIV to other people, even under circumstances where it's quite literally impossible to transmit the virus onward. Uh, and I came to that work because of an editor who, uh, Mark Chiefs, who uh, used to be at BuzzFeed, is now a professor at USC, and he had been doing work on HIV and AIDS for decades, and he knew that I was very interested in issues around um, inter, uh, interracial relations, around health and race, and so I started looking into this uh, issue about HIV criminalization, and I started seeing these very uh, recognizable patterns, where you would find HIV, where HIV would move on to AIDS, were uh, was happening in the same maps where police violence was happening, where uh, concentrations of black poverty were happening. The story that I began investigating it was in the was in a suburb just out of St. Louis in the beginning of 2014, and then I went back to uh, St. Louis for uh, to cover the Black Lives Matter movement when Michael Brown was killed, and I started seeing that the where Michael Brown was killed, where that that uh, horrific police shooting had happened, there was also a high rate of HIV and AIDS. Um, and because I'm at Medill, when I finished my PhD and began being a professor here, I did not know when I arrived whether I would have to write an academic press book, as many people have to do on their tenure uh, experience in their department. I found out because I was at Medill, I could actually write a trade book. And so I was trying to think about what, how am I going to make my dissertation research that had uh, evolved out of this reporting and had largely been about understanding the criminalization of HIV as a particular way to see systemic racism. Um, and as I was thinking about that, that's when COVID happened and COVID began. And I started seeing that it was showing up in the same maps that I had studied in Ferguson, Los Angeles, San Francisco, the same parts of cities were the same places the first people were dying, which was a bit mysterious from a virological standpoint because these are incredibly different viruses. Um, but from uh, if you looked at sort of the social structures in which people are put in the pathways of viruses the most and whose bodies are manufactured to be the most disposable socially, it was very similar. So I came to putting the book together, um, trying to build off of the work I'd done around HIV and AIDS and seeing it largely through a lens around sexuality and race, and then seeing very similar things are happening with COVID and there are these other other social ways that you can see how um, how people are kind of pre-programmed to be exposed to viruses and have very pre-programmed odds of whether or not they're going to survive. So COVID begins <clears throat> and, and it must just have turbocharged your reporting, your entire experience of this theory of a viral underclass that you were developing. It did. Like everyone, I was very scared <laughs> in the beginning or, or uh, you know, I didn't exactly know what was going to happen. Um, I had traveled, I had been in Greece where I was trying to do some research on someone who ended up being in the book um, when the first case happened in Athens. And uh, it was nearby in Italy, just, you know, a couple hundred miles. It was um, uh, away on the other side of the sea. It was happening in Italy. And then it did happen in Athens. I came back just a few days before they closed the border from um, from uh, Europe to the United States. And I arrived in New York City before going back to Chicago with a plan to go to three conferences, one in Boston, Croy, the, the, uh, for the one on uh, opportunistic infections. Um, and none of that happened. All of that got canceled while I was in New York. And so I didn't know. I just started my job. I didn't know, am I going to get laid off from Northwestern? Um, I was in the middle of like, but not fully formed into like what exactly my book was going to be. And when I talked to my agent, she had done no business. You know, these were in the early weeks, like nobody was talking to anyone. We were all home for two weeks and everyone was sort of waiting out those two weeks to see what was going to happen. Um, but she asked to look at my dissertation again, uh, my agent, Tanya McKinnon, and then said when she looked at it, like you end your dissertation thinking about a viral underclass. Think about how you could use that as an analytic analytic 
to understand what's happening now. Um, and so I wrote, I rewrote my proposal in, in less than two weeks. And when she first started having uh, meetings again, um, she started talking to people about, and I'm very lucky that I ended up with Celadon. And I had a, like a, I still had a, an outline that probably was 70% accurate <laughs> of where I ended up. Um, but we also um, said, uh, you know, amongst us that, I needed to leave room for what was going to happen because we didn't know what was going to happen. I ended up writing about some very personal stories, including of people I knew who died. Um, I did the analytic I used stayed pretty much the same, but I did not know exactly what was going to happen. Um, and so for better or for worse, I did end up working and publishing and reading and researching and writing a lot um, during these years in ways I hope were mostly emotionally helpful. I, I was glad to have something to do. Hmm. Now on the other side of that stage of things, I also realized that it was in incredibly difficult. So this is probably the point at which we should talk about you yourself caught COVID. Well, I mean, it was not in the first wave. It was last year. But can you talk about how, in fact, it would have been right just after the book was out, right? So how did that reframe this experience you've had of the past couple of years of thinking through these issues? Well, it was frustrating. Um, it didn't, I wouldn't say it really reframed it. It was a, It was an embodied experience. Uh, I had been on book tour. I'd been very nervous about it. I was in 20 different cities and I was relentless and and um, <laughs> made maybe not too many enemies, but I was very, very firm about making, about dealing with the COVID uh, protocols wherever I was. Um, and I found that as the guest coming in, you can have a lot more latitude sometimes than where you live. Um, so I had pretty effective protocols everywhere I was, but in probably either the 19th or the 20th city, the last city, because I didn't know until I got home, I did start to have symptoms. Um, and they were not horrific then. And I did kind of my own contact tracing and I was glad, like nobody around me, um, nobody around me got it at any of my events. So I most likely got it uh, in transit while I was flying or in an airport. Um, and so I'm glad that I was able to like do that. But I was aware at that point I was really doing it. There was no government there. To my knowledge, there was no government contact tracing happening at that point. It was me reaching out to everyone I knew. Um, and then after the first week or two, I started having really intense um, pain in my chest. And that was really scary and extremely painful. Um, it felt like I had... Um, it, it just felt like I had a lot of pressure in my chest. And I did sort of diagnostics to find out I wasn't having a heart attack, but I started seeing a cardiologist and I did all of these tasks. And um, and what I found out was what was happening to me was not unusual. I, I'm, I'm in my mid forties and um, a number, a lot of people, a cohort of people in their mid forties have this chest pain that lasts for four to six weeks. Um, fortunately for my echocardiogram and um, from a couple other tests, it doesn't look like anything bad was happening in my heart. It probably, it looks more like the fluid around my heart, the sac around my heart was inflamed and that I probably had a kind of um, inflammation in the in the vessels in my chest that was creating the pain. But it was incredibly, incredibly painful, very expensive, even though I have insurance, um, you know, cost hundreds or more than a thousand dollars. And I'm going to go back. I, there were a couple things that need to get followed up at, at the six point six month point. Um, and I'm aware that like once that happens, that's going to be on the other side of the public health emergency. So even more of the financial burden might be on me. Um, but particularly just from an experiential standpoint, it was so painful. It was just so physically painful. I wouldn't want anyone to go through that. And I feel better now, but I don't know what it's going to do long term to my cardiovascular system. And I'm just one person of millions, tens of millions of people who are going through this. So what it it, it made me redouble some of my own efforts. Um, it made me have a little bit of insight, I think, into what people with long COVID go through because I got a fair amount of um, uh, being just dismissed as if this was all in my head. But even if it was, like being infected with a virus that's killed millions of people is a traumatic experience. And it made me also think uh, in isolation over Thanksgiving, which I was at that point, you know, about all the people that I had lost to this virus. And that of course um, means that we need to have ongoing mental health care about that. Um, and it was extremely hard for me to get Paxlovid. I have uh, hmm. 
I have a PhD in health systems. I've done a lot of work in a med school where I am right now. Um, I had to get on the phone with my friend, Greg Gonzalez, who's, you know, like one of the world's top people in this. And, and it was still extremely difficult because I got diagnosed on a Friday in Chicago. There was no places that had it on, on the weekend. So that's like the first three days of your five day window. Um, and it certainly gave me an insight into if it's this hard for me, for someone who like studies this for a living, and I had to um, I had a really bad experience with the first healthcare provider I saw who was at an urgent care who really made me feel like I was like doctor shopping for something I shouldn't have trying to get this drug, uh, trying to get Pexlovid um, and did not work with me at all to like deal with what their concerns were. And I ended up leaving. They refused to give it to me. I ended up going to another place. And by that time, talking to Greg and other friends, I realized, oh, like, I, I think I actually have a way to get into my longstanding doctor's portal, which the directions around Paxlovid say you can actually, whether or not the doctor can access it under the e, the emergency use, I could actually look at it together on my phone or sign on their computer. And the next doctor looked in and said, oh, yes, I can see because you're on this medication, your kidney functions look fine. I can go ahead and prescribe it. But the first doctor didn't even try any of that with me. Um, and I'm sure that there are lots of people that are just being told, you don't need it, you don't, I don't want to deal with it. Um, the, the myth of federal test to trace simply did not exist on weekends in most of the country. And that's taking up two days of a five day window. Um, so that was a really, really informative experience for me to realize this drug is like functionally inaccessible for so many people and the barriers to get it are way too high. New York City was the only one I know of that had, um, uh, there could be others, but it's the only one I know of that the city had a service where people could call, they'd send out a van, test them, diagnose their risk in relation to the drug itself. And then if they pass, just give it to them there. Or if they had to do something else, would send it to them later in the day after they took took blood for tests if they had to. Um, but it's functionally uh, just not accessible to a lot of people. It's so interesting to me. First, I'm so glad you're better. I remember you tweeting pictures of like the heart monitor that you were wearing. <clears throat> and that was the point at which actually that we slid this conversation that we were going to have are now having today from last fall to the spring to now. Um, but the fact that you had so much difficulty in as privileged a situation that you, as you are, um, I vividly remember, you know, although as, as you referenced, I am based in Atlanta, I'm from New York City, I'm from Brooklyn. Uh, and uh, I vividly remember seeing the maps of COVID incidents in the first, oh, probably April, May, June of the first year. And knowing instantly what the darkest patches meant, that they were in, in a way that I actually had to explain to some friends and colleagues who didn't know New York, that those areas of highest incidence were people who were the least privileged, people who were living in congregate housing, people who were what we considered essential workers who couldn't leave their jobs and not necessarily like surgeons, but, but um, janitors in the hospitals and cashiers and 7-Elevens and so forth. People who would have to rely on public transit where they would be more exposed to crowding in order to get to those jobs where they were considered essential workers. And I thought, oh, that you know, this is before your book was out. I remember thinking, we are seeing the kind of graphical representation of the inequalities that lead to disease that we very seldom get to see with that much clarity. Um, and, and COVID really illustrated that for us, I think. Yeah, there's there's something I find almost metaphysical in that this is the first time the human race has all gone through the same thing, some version of the same thing about the same time, um, certainly with the ability to communicate about it at the same time. So it was this massive, as you're saying, uh, amount of information and learning that was happening in much more obvious ways. When I started seeing the maps, like, oh yeah, I, I know the zip codes, I know where the HIV infections are, I know where the HIV infections happen that are nipped in the bud quite quickly because the the class of people in that part of town get on medication. I know where it doesn't get diagnosed and it becomes AIDS and and, and still becomes AIDS deaths. And those were where COVID was happening. And, and it was a little counterintuitive at first because you know, a respiratory virus just moves quite differently than a retrovirus like HIV, which 
relatively speaking, HIV is quite difficult to transmit compared to something like um, COVID. But for all the reasons you're saying, there were the, there was the same kinds of people. Some people fled town, um, and some people could not flee town, and they couldn't leave their jobs. And I remember thinking early on, because a demographic difference, <clears throat> it's pretty obvious between HIV and some parts of COVID was that, of course, HIV was first being seen affecting relatively young men, uh, men who have sex with men. Um, and then COVID in the U.S., it was first largely seen amongst elderly people and then very much in front of like uh, front frontline workers uh, to a certain degree medical, but actually jobs like line cooks and retail work for things that stayed open uh, often had higher death rates because those people were getting exposed all the time to air without PPE, um, certainly without any PPE for you know the first few months. Um, but I started thinking about the ways that, and that's a big through line in my book, the populations are similar and that there are people who are being disposable. In the years of the early years of the Reagan administration, when he didn't say the word AIDS, gay people were very much considered disposable broadly politically, not just you know by Republicans, but also by many Democrats. You know, to an extent, even by the New York Times, it was extremely uncomfortable writing about it, and and people had to fight internally to get them to write about it. Um, and of course, old people are considered disposable in this country as well. Um, and we've seen this, you know, I, I think, kind of a constant, a super concentration in certain populations, uh, particularly old people and frontline workers. As many people, including myself, were able to largely work from home, that was a big barrier of protection in lots of ways, particularly if you live alone, like I did for most, excuse me, for most of the pandemic, although there were social harms from, from living alone as well in that. But physically, there were bar you know, there were barriers to viral transmission and exposure. Um, and then then the the world you know kind of kicked into gear to try to protect work you know working people and as capital saw that that the production could get interrupted more and more resources went into this um into into prevention um and so we had this period of time where many people were where some people were more protected than the vaccines came out now we're in a period of time again where who is actually getting exposed the most and sick and dying is again very very concentrated you know hundreds of people are dying in nursing homes a month again the last time i looked 140 i think it was in february 140 nursing home workers died and then there were hundreds of patients as well um and it's all out of sight out of mind again and the structural things to deal with it, it stages very successfully. Like there was a period of time where 95% of you know people living in nursing homes were <clears throat> all vaccinated. They didn't become anti-vax when when the boosters came out. The apparatus that went to them and got them vaccinated has just disappeared. Um, and so there's a lot more leeway, a lot more exposure. Um, a lot more deeming people disposable that's happening to a percent of the population that is not particularly visible and not um, beloved or much cared for by media and by a lot of government forces. And so I think we're seeing a, a real concentration much more there um, than across the broader population. And at the same time, the data that would show us where that's happening is disappearing, right? The data dashboards have been shut down. We no longer have good tracking. With the national emergency going away, we'll he have even less visibility into what's going on. Um, it, it, it is, as you say, as though we learned no lessons from this, as though we're right back where we were in 2020. Uh, yeah, like sort of a... a um assessment of this moment, it feels pretty bleak. Um, and it's it's quite upsetting that the, you know, just this week, the public health emergency was rescinded and um, understanding that lots of resources that helped people with this, but in general, with things that, that, that create poor health outcomes, particularly 15 million people kind of casually being thrown off of Medicaid in the past few weeks, um, it, it does feel really bleak looking at that. At the same time, uh, you know, I'm also in, in my many hats as an American studies interdisciplinary scholar, I have a historian hat as well. Um, and so the life of what happens politically, of course, is not lost. Like things are good things can still come out of what's happened during this time. Very much reminded of this. I, I live here in Chicago. I went last night to a 
panel um, with left activists about the election of mayor-elect Brandon Johnson. Um, and in that, you could very clearly see it was it was like a quite a broad coalition that got him into office, including the Chicago Teachers Union and lots of young people. And you could very, listening to these activists, you could very, very directly see the line to what Occupy Wall Street did to train to educate some people but also to educate people who organized and also what the black lives matter movement did um and i've been a journalist long enough to hear people say oh occupy accomplished nothing blm accomplished nothing you're like seeing you're seeing it in tennessee as well right now you know with the with the two lawmakers so i think the second was reinstated today today yeah um so like what happens out of uh, out of political conscious raising like the benefits of that happen for decades or centuries of course we have lots of benefits from the civil rights movement of the mid 20th century still and so i think everything that happened that was an experience felt by everybody in the world in some way um what that did to you children what that did to teens what that did to people in their 20s like the things they learned and, and what they experienced out of that are not ending right now even though it feels bleak that is going to have an expression in the way that they drive policy create um, networks of care try as you know as they get more power themselves as teens become adults as children become teens like they're gonna take the things that they learned from this experience and i think that there will be um lots of positive things that happen about the ways that we were very very aware of our communal relationship to one another in a way that is not so obvious. As you said, the deaths were very obvious for a while. Um, and so was the way that we depended on one another was very obvious for a while. And there will still be benefits about that, I think. So I want to ask about that, but first I'm going to to remind all the folks who are watching us. I can see all your numbers on our dashboard. Thank you all so much for listening to us. Um, you can, If you have questions or comments, we especially like questions. You can put them into the comment boxes or the or you can reply, you can what, whatever is available where you are watching, except on Twitter, we're sorry. Um, please do, and I will be sure to voice those questions to Stephen when we get just a little bit further into the hour. But for now, I'd like to go back just before COVID. Um, and the, one of the things that's so striking about your book uh, is that even though it began as an, a, as an academic text, because it was first based on your dissertation, it's it's. But that was also based on reporting before that. So I like to think I. So so it's very helical. The academia and then hustle the academia back out into. <laughs> so it's um, you you make your points through narrative, and I think particularly through the characters that you choose, and there are some really heartrending stories, really rich, really sensitively told about people whom you chose, whom you not only knew personally, but people whom you chose to embody the points you want to make about the ways in which um, the, the, the health disparities and the, the experience of people who experience viruses are, are not accidents, but rather are the, the, the result of structural choices that we've made as a society. We'll talk more about that in a minute, but tell me first about some of the people. Well, um, in addition to Michael Johnson, who's someone that I met um, as a as a reporter, um, there were a number of people that I wrote about who who died, who either what knew directly or was kind of one person removed from. Um, and one of the people I think that really helped me broaden the concept of what this book could be um, was a young man named Zach Christopoulos in Greece. Um, I had won a, while I was writing my dissertation and I had the Michael Johnson trial was over, I was sifting through hundreds of pages of court transcripts. I had been at that point reporting for three or four years for The Guardian, um, routinely on police things and getting tear gassed and, and dealing with all the trauma of that. And then I got a dissertation writing fellowship that allowed me to go to Greece for three months. And I thought, great, I will eat feta cheese and um, I will write during the day and not think about all these horrible things around police violence in the United States. But about a week after I'd been there, um, there was a young man who was kicked to death by a mob of eight people in broad daylight. Four of them were police officers. And he just so happened to be the most prom one of the most prominent HIV activists in the country. His name was Zach Kostopoulos. He was queer. He was a drag queen. He did all kinds of work, uh, uh, political work with migrant people. Um, and so that and his life and investigating who he was and his extraordinary life and, and the, the gifts that he gave to people and how much they mourned him um, was a really... 
uh, important uh, way for me to understand that so much of my thinking correctly, you know, in the United States around health had been thinking about the history of the transatlantic slave trade and things around racial disparities. Um, and here was somebody who was white in Greece and I could trace similar, like different things in the US, but similarly to austerity, to the ways that austerity um, create conditions through which viruses transmit more were all happening. Um, and so I ended up meeting many of his friends, his family, um, trying to, to trace the end of his life. I've spent a lot of time where, where he was killed was very close to where I was working at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and it was a really beautiful Beautiful experience. He also left a lot of, he was known in Greece for being the first person to like talk about being HIV positive on social media. And so he left this treasure trove. Um, and I didn't know actually until deep into the process. I knew he, he was Greek American. He'd lived in the United States as a child, but it wasn't until near the end of my reporting that I actually started finding YouTube videos of him speaking in English. Um, and so it was really beautiful to get to hear him in his own words. Um, I wrote about Lorena Borjas, who was a really beautiful and wonderful trans Latinx um, uh, activist. The anniversary of her death was actually just a couple weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And she was in my outer circle, outer social circle. I'd met her once uh, when I had been writing a story, but she was kind of the queen mother of the trans Latinx community in Queens. Um, and what she was known for was standing out on the street, handing out food, handing out syringes, serial syringes, handing out condoms, um, trying to do disease, you know, disease prevention, get people food. Um, and what she was, she was also known for barging into anyone's office and demanding they help her with, with um, the right things in social justice. And she would show up in court. That was the thing she was probably known for most. She created a bail bond before, a little bit before bail bonds started getting um, more broadly used to get people out of protests with BLM. Um, and anytime she heard in her network that a trans person had been arrested, she would show up uh, at court. She'd find other trans women. They'd go to court. They post bail for the person and then they would swear to the judge, even if they knew the person or not, like we vouch for them, we will get them back here on their arraignment day and they have people who are going to look out for them. Um, and so she was the first person that died in my outer social circle and it was devastating to a lot of my friends. Um, it was the first Zoom funeral I went to, which had, she died at six or seven in the morning and that evening they had a memorial that 400 people came to on Zoom. Um, and so she was a, a great teacher to me, both in thinking about um, what it meant for her to be made vulnerable as a trans woman, as a migrant, uh, who had been undocumented for, for much of her life in the United States, but had, uh, recently um, everything had, had worked out on that front. Um, this is a woman who was living with HIV, which she'd had for a couple of decades, and then who also got COVID. And in the last couple of weeks of her life, all of those structural barriers around uh, around her nationality, around her language, around stigma for being trans and HIV positive, all of that came together in a really horrifying way in, in the last week of her life um, before she died alone. And one of the reasons why I write about that so much and the, the film 76 Days, the Chinese documentary I, I recently uh, screened in a, in a film festival about viruses, um, took me back to something I think a lot of people are forgetting, even just a few years out, that, that people died alone, or they died, I shouldn't say alone, but they died with healthcare workers um, uh, taking very, very beautiful care of them, but they died alone from their loved ones because you could not go into the hospital. She, she died on one of these days where I think 400 people died of COVID just in New York City. Um, and so despite this life that she had built of showing up for people, being out in the street for people, always to, putting people up in her studio apartment, anyone who needed a place to sleep, she was isolated by herself in the end of her life. Um, and so I thought she, that one of the reasons why I really wanted to write about her was that she represented so many of these things. She was so generous. Um, and then her loss after dying alone was very broadly felt because when someone of her stature dies in the community. It's not just a loss for the people who love them. She's no longer handing out the condoms. She's no longer handing out the syringes. That's allowing more virus to flourish. I found her story particularly moving, and especially because as you say, she, she forced these bail funds and bail communities really into being. And, and this picture that I had of how she and, and other trans women in her circle would, as you say, show up in court 
and force the court to understand that there might not be what the court would understand as a nuclear family. They weren't necessarily going to be releasing someone to their mother, their father, their brother, but they were going to be releasing them to a, a complex, fully realized social circle that was going to take care of this person and make sure they continue to engage with the system. I, I just found that sort of uniquely moving. And it, it ties so beautifully in with this concept that you develop in the book um, of social prophylaxis, hmm. that prophylaxis is not only a, a medical thing that we do. I happen to be spending the day writing about prophylaxis. So this is particularly fresh in my mind. Um, but that, that this is one of the both, both one of the built-in protections for those of us who are privileged, but also possibly one of the things that we can reach for as we try to change the situations that you've written about. Yeah, thank you. That was one of the concepts that took me a while to uh, get right, or I hope I got it right, and a lot through conversations with with my friend Greg Gonzalez, where I thought about how the, you know there's physical prophylaxis that a lot of people understand. It's just it's a barrier. So condoms or masks or things like that. Uh, condoms are often colloquially called prophylactics, or they were. I think that's generationally, but uh, older. Um, but um, then there are these way there are these things that other that that also physically give us protection. Social distancing is a form of prophylaxis. Living in a home that has bedrooms for every person was an enormous prophylaxis at keeping people physically from, you know, encountering the virus as much. But then there are these social ones. And I, I really, it was through conversations with Greg where I started thinking about the viruses like don't have politics themselves, but they're all these things that are directing them one way or the other. And that, of course, is very political. And so if you have sex education, that's a form of prophylaxis. We, there's long and hard data about states that have comprehensive sex education, have lower rates of STIs and lower rates of uh, teenage pregnancy um, than states that do not have it. Um, and of course, that's also true with LGBT sex education, which is very, very hit or miss around the country, whether anyone gets it. Um, and I've been thinking about this a lot since the book came out. There have been, I don't think any of them passed before the book came out, but you know, since then, Texas, Florida, Arkansas, Tennessee, these states that are making gender affirming care um, inaccessible for trans youth and for poor trans people, because they all strip it for Medicaid and increasingly they just, just want to get rid of it from adults. They're making all kinds of ways that it's almost impossible for any adults to get it. Um, and so like at the level of the virus, if if people who are transitioning are able to get their medical care from a provider um, with a sterile syringe and a supportive environment, of course, they're much less likely to encounter viruses. If they have to get that care on the contraband market, there's a much higher rate that they're going to get HIV, hepatitis, any number of things that happen with not with using syringes where you cannot vouch for how sterile they are. Um, but then there's also like the matter of the information that people have and whether or not they're able to get tested and treated for the things happening to them. And I've also been thinking about this since my, the book came out right before, or came out after the, the draft was completely done. It came out a little bit after the Dobbs decision. Mm -hmm. um, but I've been thinking about like the relationship with abortion that, um, and this I do write about in the book in Scott County, Indiana, which had the fastest outbreak ever of HIV recorded in the country. Mm -hmm. The reason why it moved so quickly was because Mike Pence had basically run all the uh, clinics that provided abortion out of the lower half of the state. And those were the same places that also did HIV prevention, HIV education, HIV testing. So there was no testing. So by the time they were aware that HIV was moving, it had exploded, um, you know, whereas had it happened in New York City, there's a much higher rate that somebody involved with it would have been routinely tested for it. But here it didn't happen because there was no surveillance. Places that often perform abortions are doing this other important work. Now with Dobbs, you know, with dozens of, of clinics that perform abortions that have closed, those are also enormous pockets of places where SDI education, treatment, um, prevention are not happening. Even in the, the, the county where my story originated, where Michael Johnson was arrested for HIV transmission and accused of being a menace to the public health that they had to prosecute for, they closed their STI clinic recently. So they don't have anyone even doing that preventative work or testing people or trying to find it. Uh, and there are uh, hundreds of counties like that in the US where this this like this work isn't happening. So unfortunately, I predict that um, where we see 
closures of abortion clinics, we're also probably going to end up seeing more clusters around transmissible STIs. So we have a bunch of questions that I, from people who are watching that I want to ask you, but there's one thing that I want to mention first, because I just tripped across this statistic today, and it so much confirms what you just said, is that it, um, so New York City, as you probably know, because you know the city so well, um, you just recently did its own sexually transmitted infection surveillance and its report of its most recent numbers. Uh, and as you could predict, the, the numbers of STIs correlate very well with income and with race. The places where there are the most infections are not the whitest or the most affluent neighborhoods. What was shocking to me in, in looking at this was to see it mapped and realize that the places where there's the most incidence are also the places where the brick and mortar sexually transmitted infection clinics are being closed in the city. Yeah, That doesn't seem to be an accident. That seems again, as we talked about a moment ago to be a structural choice. Yeah, I haven't thinks, so. I, I am aware of it and I've seen the top sheet. I have not gotten to go through it yet. Um, I've been really upset that the Adams administration did closures during Monkey Pot, which I'm writing a new chapter for the paperback of my book, and I'm going to write about my experiences, my own experiences with Monkey Pox and trying to get vaccinated and um, what I saw. And that was very much a, a situation where, yeah, there was like, first, they only were giving out the vaccine in a clinic in Chelsea, which is a very gay neighborhood, but a very white neighborhood. And one of these neighborhoods where HIV transmission happens, but then it almost immediately gets um, people get onto medication. They don't they don't advance onto AIDS because there's because there's an open clinic there, <laughs> and the places where they've closed the clinics, there's much less likelihood. And we were seeing even as we knew that um, that the majority of cases of of MPX were happening amongst Latin and Black men, um, the places in East New York, Brooklyn the Bronx, Harlem, where we already know HIV transmission happens and other STIs, um, they were not flooding those places with the vaccine first. And, and, and I think there were like a couple scheduled closures uh, of clinics that happened during that time. Um, and the, the geographer, Ruth Wilson Gilmore, has this great term. Um, now, of course, it's going on my head. Um, manufactured, ah, I don't know what's going on in my head. It'll come back to me. Um, but she talks about how, um, uh, she talks about how, you know, we manufacture the outcomes of, of what happens to people. And, and as a geographer, she talks about how it, it's geographically happening. And yes, in New York City, like if you're closing the STI clinics at East New York and Brownsville and places like that, where you need to be proactive that is the state making people vulnerable to viruses. I, I think a lot in my book about vectors and how journalists sometimes will talk irresponsibly about term, terms like host or vector as if people are doing something wrong. Organized abandonment. That's the term of Ruth Wilson Gilmore. Sorry. <laughs> uh, we, we organize abandonment. Um, so we'll often talk about as journalists vectors um, as if people are doing something wrong, but it's the structure that does it. If the teens in Florida can't get hormones from their doctor as they were safely able to a year ago, that's the state organizing and abandoning what they need to not encounter viruses. If the city of New York is pulling out of the brick and mortar places where they know they need to go out because those people do not have the ability, like they're not going to their family doctor every year because they don't have insurance. Um, that's where you need to have the government step in and do that public health work. And if they are pulling out of them or not opening those when they know that it's needed, that's an organized choice to abandon those people. So this is the perfect moment to ask this question, which comes from Odrika uh, Chataraj, who asks, were there lessons that were learned in HIV that were applied to, to COVID and to MPOX, as we should call it now? And uh, what were they or did we not? There are lots of lessons. I mean, as, as, as I... <sighs> As I have been saying for a long time, like they're very different viruses. So it's not like sort of a one on one comparison. One of the very difficult things, having just re shown one of the documentaries about ACT UP, the, the major political group um, that um, advocated for AIDS and medication, and is the reason why we're vaccinated because they upended, forced an upend process of 
of what it took to get drugs uh, to people more quickly. Um, but their organizing was happening in a way that had a material difference, that you did not get HIV from being in a meeting together. And so that was a really difficult reality that we had to deal with. We, we simply could not be together safely, um, you know, in that first year. Um, I think that ACT UP showed that it doesn't take that many people to affect change, that you can work together very effectively. And, and they did a lot of things that helped um, push, uh, that helped push the government and the regulatory agencies and the corporations to move faster. Um, there are a lot of things that they did that worked very well for MPOX or MPX um, because we saw with, with um, it happened with COVID as well, but particularly when, when MPX started showing up, it was very fast that gay organizations were prepared. Sex parties, sex clubs, LGBT centers, LGBT businesses, you know, er, like they were all like ready immediately and, and gay men particularly like were ready to get that vaccine. And a lot of that draws on organizing that happened um, from HIV, where there were these organized ways that queer spaces would teach about safer sex. Condoms did not used to be used by gay men before that because condoms were something used to stop um, procreation, but there wasn't a real need to deal with them for men who had sex with men prior to that. And so like all that education very clearly was used in MPOX as well. It happened with COVID too. Um, it was really interesting for me to talk to people. I was barely alive at the beginning of, of AIDS, but to talk to people who are quite cognizant and to say, and to hear them talk about how hard it was to get the world to react to them. And then there was a small period of that with COVID, but then once it was understood anyone could get this, then like the governments of the world kicked in in a very different way than it had with COVID. I'm sorry, than it had with AIDS. Um, and then something similar, like there was similar disappointment with MPOX that it was not happening as quickly. You know, for example, I talked to an organization that um, hosted, uh, they were a gay son in Chicago. They hosted, um, uh, vaccination clinics for COVID. And then they eventually got paid for it as they should, because they were closing their business and using their staff, you know, to do this. I mean, lots of people were happy to do the volunteer work, but they did get a little bit of payment um, for, you know, the loss of their business. No such thing happened for MPOX. Like with MPOX, that was, that, that did not happen. They, they were not getting that reimbursement and they were made to feel like this is something you should do just for the community. And they did do it for the community, but the message was like that this isn't important because this is not affecting, you know, the whole population. Um, so that was a lesson I thought that was, that was lost a little bit from AIDS and COVID that like we knew how to do some pretty big things and some of them we did well. We got 4 million shots a day out. How do we said like, yes, we need this kind of infrastructure. You know, we could maybe not 4 million shots a day, but maybe the U.S. needs the standing ability to give a million shots a day. And then once a year, uh, you know, 1% of the population goes and gets their COVID shot, their booster and their flu shot. And meningitis is happening over there. Okay, you know, we can activate it through here or there's a, a breakout of MPX over here. We can use, you know, we can use that infrastructure for that. And all of that was dismantled. And I feel like we should have learned from AIDS and from COVID that these things are going to happen and we need the infrastructure to deal with them. So this is a good point at which to relay more of a comment than a question <laughs> from uh, Dr. Renee Nahara, who's watching, who um, commented that there's been a natural experiment in HPV vaccination that in Texas, which rescinded a requirement for HPV, um, there's one of the highest rates of cervical cancer in the US. And if you can compare that to the experience in Australia, where it's tied to receiving public benefits, and they're on the verge of eliminating cervical cancer, again, a structural choice, not something that just nat naturally happens. But before we move on to this question of, uh, of structure, which I do want to talk more about, I do want to relay a question from another member of the audience. Um, Lauren Palacio asked about the patterns we've been talking about of, of social exclusion and health disparities, do these translate across different demographic regions? So we've been talking about black and brown urban areas, but uh, are they, and densely populated areas, is there a similar pattern for, for rural areas, for areas that are largely not minoritized? Are there other patterns of exclusion or disparity beside the ones we've been talking about? <laughs> 
Yeah, so my book is is broken into 12 vectors. I think about 12 different ways that a viral underclass is produced. And for me, one of the biggest shifts from my journalism reporting to my dissertation, which was very much about um, race and kind of a system, like illustrating a systemic form of, of racism, um, this book then says this happens in other places. This is happening in Greece where um, there's a housing crash and Athens has had very good experience doing sterile syringe exchange on the street, going out to people and giving out syringes to people who are um, in, in using injection drugs or, or dealing with addiction. Um, then the austerity machine kicks in from Germany and, you know, and the EU and the uh, World Monetary Fund. Um, and then HIV goes up 3000% because they cut those programs. That's the same dynamic. Thatcherism in England, you know, it's not, it does not have, it's not without a racial component. I'll say that, but even amongst the, um, the largely white um, uh, council estate, you know, equivalent to, to impoverished housing in England, the same thing's happening there. Greece is kind of what got me to, to see like what the, the dynamic of what happened in Athens um, where they, they, were not doing the outreach and they didn't have their surveillance for it suddenly it was similar to 270 counties in the US mostly in Appalachia where there simply was they're just sitting ducks there's no outreach there's no uh there's no way to kind of look for surveillance and so piggybacked on top of the um the opioid epidemic and the epidemic of injection drugs which is deindustrialization happening more in rural areas it's a quite similar pattern to deindustrialization say in the Bronx or in Los Angeles or in urban America where AIDS first broke out, but now you have the industrialization happening in uh, rural places and all the same dynamics are happening and it's happening to white people. And so I, my book, the forward to my book is written by Jonathan Metzl who wrote Dying of Whiteness. Um, and I've also been in conversation a lot since I wrote the book with Beth Macy who wrote the book Dope Sick. I didn't know until we were on a book panel together that she's from my father's hometown um, of which I've not had contact with there for decades because my, my father's been deceased about 20 years and it's like one of these rusting towns where they're dealing with all these things in my book that I've written about in uh, you know in in largely black or queer America they're dealing with it in white rural America and so these dynamics are global I mean I, I write about Korea I write about other countries my book is pretty U.S. focused and I do think that there's a particular thing that's true to the United States crosses racial lines and demographics, but of course it has disparate impacts. Um, and that we create, like we create a viral underclass around just not being able to access healthcare. They have issues in the EU, uh, but they don't like barriers or the idea that you're going to be indebted or actually being indebted are not among them. And I think that's one of the things that really bit us here across uh, racial lines. Like there was a lot of worry that there would be disparities with black people taking the vaccine. Ultimately, black people are vaccinated a little bit higher. There are barriers to making sure they could get the vaccine and making sure that they, if they had to take time off from work or get to places that that was addressed. But once that was addressed, um, white people took it a little bit less. And one of the reasons why I think we have so much vaccine hesitancy in this country, a part of it is that if you've been told that you're just left for dead for your whole life by hospitals, insurance companies, and the government. If you've had a cancer diagnosis and it's like, oh, well, you know, lose your house, that's on you. And then suddenly the government says, oh, but here's a medicine you should take um, and it's free. Like, I understand that there's suspicion there. And we, we deal with the fallout of the kind of world that we've built. And we've built a world where only certain people are supposed to even think they have access to health, that they're even worthy of having access to health. So then when you have a mass campaign, it makes it very hard to connect with them. Um, so yeah, I, I write about all different parts of the country and I try to write across lines of race, but my journey was starting around race, particularly black white relations and realizing, oh, there's all this stuff about colonialism, Native Americans, Latin America, national borders, Asia, Africa, that relate to the US and that are happening around the world in, in their own ways too. So the thing that I'd like to finish on, because amazingly we're close to the end of the hour, is that as much as we've been talking about how all of these phenomena that, that you've observed are the result of deliberate structural choices that we've made in society, you also raise the possibility toward the end of the book that, that we could make different choices, that we could allow viruses 
to unite us rather than to divide us, that we could see connection at, through paths of infection um, and, and reframe this, this um, stratification of society as that results in a viral underclass to have a quite different result. So could you talk about that for a minute, about how you see some hope emerging from this? Well, there, yeah, I, I think often, and I try not to romanticize it, um, that viruses are incredibly powerful teachers and not that they're writing on a board or like that they have conscious message for us, but they force us to acknowledge the reality of how connected we are and that my fate is not disconnected from yours. Um, and for me, one of the, the biggest challenges intellectually, and I think politically for other people too, that our fate is connected to other species. Like Purdue, and this was a zoonotic virus, um, the ways that we treat other species on this planet are going to come back on us, particularly as the planet gets warmer and more living beings are descending on smaller habitable parts of the globe. We have to understand how to live in relationship with one another. And I think a particular challenge for us in the United States is that everything about our socializing is like we are each the... We are each the you know villain or hero of our own hero's journey, and we sink or swim based on our grit. And of course, our it's much more complicated than that. And our um, fates are connected to one another. You know, it was interesting seeing in 2020 how countries were initially faring with COVID, and ultimately, you know, the United States, by some metrics, the wealthiest country in the world, obviously not equally felt, you know, did the worst. Um, and the predictors were not. Uh, how rich a country was. It was actually like one of the most useful predictors was what percent of a country's health budget, even if it's very small, are they using for preventive care? Um, so in the US, we spent almost entirely on reactionary care at the, at the, at the moment of crisis and even just like in the last moments of your life before in the last weeks or days of your life. Um, but then there are all kinds of poor countries and particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, and in Asia, where they've been dealing with um, dengue fever or um, malaria or HIV, and there are public health workers who have been connected to communities for years or decades. And when they, you know, the person who gives you a mosquito net every year, if they then come along and say, hey, there's this new thing, we need to be careful around it, people are more inclined to trust them. Whereas in the US, we're totally terrified of dealing with health people, because anytime you deal with a health person, you could like potentially lose your house. You know, you can end up in so much debt that you that you lose your home. And so that has a, a big effect. And I think the viruses give us an opportunity to understand like we are connected to one another. Our fates are shared. Um, I also been feeling a lot of, of sadness, you know, to be completely honest about sort of where things are politically right now. And I remember the summer of 2020 with nostalgia, which I know is somewhat misplaced, but also I was in New York where we we had gone <clears throat> up this horrific death peak. And then it was quite low that summer. So there was relief. Everyone was kind of waiting for the vaccine. But we also had this moment, I just felt there was a moment of mass conscious awareness of what was really important in life. Like people deeply missed their loved ones. They deeply missed being able to see their grandparents and their parents and eat with their friends. Um, and so this whole experience gave us the opportunity to like really reflect on and build on what we know to be really important and to let go of the stuff that's not so important. And so that's that, I think, to me, it's one of the things that gives me the most hope. That seems like a good place to end. <laughs> I will I will, will trust that your hope is justified. Stephen Thrasher, thank you so much for joining this series. This has been a fascinating hour. I so much appreciate your taking the time. And I'm looking forward to the, the paperback in the next edition of the book because I want to read that chapter on monkeypox. <laughs> thank you so much. So thank you, everyone. That's it for this edition of the Health Storytelling author Q&A series. Please consider following Stephen on social media. You can see his handle, ThrasherXY, for Twitter on the screen. And please buy his book, which is available at his publisher, Macmillan, and at Amazon, and also at bookshop.org, which is the anti-Amazon. It's a platform that funnels orders to independent bookstores. And if you like actually going to bookstores, we urge you to follow the link we're also providing for IndieBound.com. That site will show you which independent bookstore close to you is carrying Stephen's book. 
So this also concludes this semester's iteration of this author interview series in which we heard not only from Stephen Thrasher, but from Bethany Brookshire and from Elena Konis. Again, this series is hosted by the Center for the Study of Human Health at Emory University. We are so grateful to them. Co-sponsored by the Georgia Center for the Book and Science Gallery Atlanta. So grateful for their support. And we also had special support this semester from the Atlanta Science Festival, and it was a thrill to join their efforts to spread science learning around Atlanta. So that's it. On behalf of all of those sponsors and from me, Thank you for watching this series. Come see us again in the fall.